Oke, okay, uh, kita mulai ya. Oke, okay, uh, thank you everyone. Good afternoon, konnichiwa. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. <laughs> ya, yeah. yeah, thank you uh, for coming to this uh, discussion series. Uh, so this discussion series uh, is under collaboration between Pusat Pengembangan Wilayah Pesisiran Laut or in English Center for Coastal and Marine Development collaborate with uh, Balai Teknik Pantai, Coastal uh, uh, Experimental Station, uh, PUPR. So actually uh, this activity is under a research project, namely Satraps uh, with the title Building a Sustainable System for Resilience and Innovation in Coastal Community. So this research project is the collaboration between ITB Kyoto, also with many uh, university and stakeholder, of course, PUPR, BNPB, uh, UGM, other, and many other university and also research institute. And this collaboration uh, of research project uh, is will be conducted for five years, starting from 2022 until 2026. And then for uh, the principal investigator itself for, from Indonesia uh, is uh, myself, uh, Farid, from uh, PPWPL, Pusat Pengembangan Pesisir dan Laut, and from uh, Kyoto University or from Japanese side, uh, the principal investigator is Professor Nobuhito Mori from Disaster Prevention Research Institute, Kyoto University. And uh, for this uh, research, we have uh, four main team. Uh, the first thing about the coastal uh, about the monitoring system the second topic uh, for our project is related to the hazard assessment and then the third topic is about the green infrastructure and the fourth topic is about social implementation so uh, uh, yeah because this is the multidisciplinary project so we have many uh, partners yeah, including uh, from Indonesian side and also Japanese side and then uh, a part of this uh, project uh, activities, we also have uh, knowledge transfer yeah, between Indonesian side and Japanese side. So this activities today is part of the knowledge transfer between the uh, Japanese side and Indonesia side. Uh, of course, the speaker for today uh, is from Japan, but also uh, uh, from the discussion, we we welcome. Uh, the suggestion or uh, maybe comment that can uh, be very useful for our research project. I think uh, uh, that is for the introduction and for today's uh, event, uh, today's discussion uh, series, uh, it will be moderated by Ibu Entin from uh, Coastal Engineering Department, also from Faculty of Civil and Environmental uh, Engineering. Yeah, engineering. Uh, I think we will have around two hours, uh, two hours. Uh, maybe we can divide one hour for presentation and one hour from for discussion. Oh, okay, okay, no problem. Yes, uh, for more recent, I think one hour and then uh, 30 minutes. Yeah, okay, 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 okay. Thank you, Quentin. So, uh, yeah, uh, we have. Uh, Mori Sensei, as I uh, told you before, and then also we have uh, Eva Miyasiska Yamamoto and uh, Koda Yamamoto, uh, also from Kyoto University. And uh, yeah, because Ibu Eva, also from Indonesia, uh, he graduated from ITB. Uh, he and uh, she, sorry, she entered ITB in 1997. Yeah. 1997 and then continue his uh, uh, school at uh, Kyoto. So if there is any discussion or comments or suggestion that uh, want to be delivered in Indonesia, so it would be no problem. Yeah, Ibu Eva will understand very well. <laughs> okay, thank you. I think that's all from me. Uh, so uh, please uh, enjoy uh, the discussion and uh, I will give uh, the speaker the, the mic to uh, Ibu Entin.
please Bundin. Thank you for Pak Farid. Selamat siang semuanya. Good afternoon everyone. Uh, welcome to this discussion and especially welcome to our three distinguished speaker, Professor Mori, uh, Dr. Eva and Dr. Kodai from the Disaster Prevention Research Institute Kyoto University. I think I don't need to explain more about uh, this our distinguished speaker today. Uh, so we just to save time, probably we can just start. Before this first uh, talk from Professor Mori that entitled the impact assessment of climate change on natural hazard in coastal area, I would like to read his uh, very short bio. It's not an easy task because uh, his bio is unbelievable long, uh, but um, Professor Mori received his bachelor degree, master's degree, and PhD from the Gifu University, Japan. Uh, his PhD in 1996. And then he joined Osaka University as lecturer and then moved to uh, Kyoto University and he became a full professor at 2018. So I noticed uh, Professor Mori. Since 2018, so you have published probably more than 500 probably scientific papers and his age index in Google Scholar is 46 and he got more than 9,300 9, citations. And this is the note that I take. For the last five years, he got 5,300 almost citation. Yeah, okay, I, ch I check, you're a Google Scholar. scholar. So we know that he's been doing recently a very, very important research. So we are very, very pleased to have you here uh, to, without further ado, this is very long. What else? There you have honors as the Postal Engineering Journal Citation Award prize with that more than 5,000. And then best paper, best thing, best, 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 best. And also editors. Stop. Okay. See, I have had several, but I think that would be enough to picture our distinguished speaker today, uh, Professor Mori. The floor is yours. Terimakasih, uh, Entin. Nama saya Nobel Mori from Kyoto University. Kenalkan. Putus, tendong akhiris. <laughs> I didn't mention, okay. Appreciate it so much. With your condition, you're still here in Bandung. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry to behave like this because I cannot stand <laughs> due to the uh, putus, <laughs> tendong akhiris. Saya tidak bisa bahasa Indonesia. So I'm going to speak English. <laughs> I'm sorry for that. And first, I'm appreciate for kind of, and the preparation of this great you know, uh, discussion by Professor Muhammad Hari, uh, Farid. And I'm also appreciate uh, Dr. Adi Prasetyo from Barai Pantai Technik uh, in PLPL. And he, he, it is also nice to you know uh, uh, talking in the same room with uh, Adi because he graduated from our university uh, in uh, 2000. Uh, seven, 17, and uh, I'm happy to back to ITB today. And today my talk is a, a little bit far from the engineering due to the request by Professor Farido. So I'm going to talk about the climate change impact on the coastal zone. But at the end, this kind of topic is going to be related to the engineering. So that I'm uh, going to talk today. And uh, this uh, talk is uh, broadcast to the uh, PUPR, so I put my my face <laughs> on the first page. It, for me, it looks the same, but uh, <laughs> it doesn't look like same due to the AI. <laughs> AI makes me make my picture better. <laughs> then, uh, in the beginning, I just briefly mentioned about uh, our university, Kyoto University in Japan. So some of you know, some of you know, but others not. 
So, uh, uh, can you down the light in front? Yeah, thank you very much. It's just a little bit bright. So Kyoto University established uh, 1897. Uh, it's uh, one of oldest university in Japan. And uh, we are not really big university in number because we have uh, 3,000 professors and uh, uh, 4, uh, uh, 14,000 undergrad and uh, 10,000 uh, master and PhD. So total number of students are around uh, 15,000 uh, for 3,000 faculty. On the other hand, uh, we are uh, kind of top so-called research university in Japan. We generally we divide university into the two categories. One is research university, the other is educational university. We are in the uh, top level of the uh, research university in Japan. So uh, we have already 11 uh, Nobel Prize winners in our university. And uh, I don't know exact number, but we have around 12 Nobel Prize winners in Japan, but uh, uh, 11 of 12 from Kyoto University. So we are very proud of it. And uh, uh, so, yeah, you may, but it's not related to civil engineering, so <laughs> it's just advertisement. We are also good at mathematics, so we have two field medal winner in mathematics. So we are very proud of our top research level in our university, right? And uh, we are working in the uh, Disaster Prevention Research Institute, DPRI. It's a part of the research institute system in Kyoto University. And uh, we are part of the uh, Department of Civil Engineering, but our main uh, appointment is uh, this DPRI, Disaster Prevention Research Institute. And it's, we are a little bit younger compared with our university history. We started uh, almost 70 to 75 years ago after the severe disaster in Japan. Then we have close to 100 professors, full professors in our research institute uh, covering uh, volcano, seismology, uh, uh, severe weather, climate change, hydraulics, hydrology, uh, geotechnic, uh, and so on. And there are 100 professors, uh, full professors, and uh, uh, one, uh, 50 postdocs, uh, 100 PhD students, and uh, 150 masters in our uh, institution. And uh, we have a small number of the undergrad. It's around 30 to 40. So total number of our uh, research institute members are around uh, 500 to uh, 450. So we are pretty big for disaster because Natural disaster in Japan is very severe, same to the Indonesia. We have uh, earthquake, volcano, uh, it's same to Indonesia. We also have a typhoon, but yes, uh, heavy precipitation <laughs> and storm. And uh, we also have a severe winter storm from Siberia. So we are, uh, uh, Japan country itself is very severe for natural disasters in the sense of the uh, developed country. You know, Europe continent is very stable. So there's no severe uh, disaster in Europe. European severe, uh, severe heavy precipitation is uh, 50 millimeter per day, but for us, 50 millimeter per hour is you know <laughs> severe. So you may con you know realize how severe uh, weather in Asia. But yes, oh yeah. Uh, additionally, <laughs> yes. Kyoto is a cultural city, same to. Bandung, we are university city. 10% uh, of the population is student, university student, because we, there are more than 40 universities in Kyoto. So generally students enjoy life in Kyoto. So uh, if you are curious, please <laughs> ask me more details. So I'm but going to enter to the main story of today, climate change. So uh, regarding uh, hazard assessment, risk assessment uh, uh, beside the climate change, uh, there are three important components. One is the hazard, of course. You know, we want to know how tsunami is high and how you know, waves, uh, storm waves are high. So has, it is important understanding intensity and frequency relation of the hazard. For example, if you want to construct some you know, coastal structure or whatever embankment, you, want, you need to know 
for example, uh, what's the maximum water level in uh, uh, every n of uh, one by n year, one by 100 years or one by 50 years, depend on the your situation. So frequency intensity relation is important to uh, manage hazard risk. And uh, this is also important for the uh, insurance, hazard insurance too. Because you know insurance is a kind of gambling, so you need <laughs> you need uh, expected value in advance. Then second point is variability. Variability is uh, what is harmed by the hazard, right? There is uh, uh, so uh, sorry, uh, the exposure. Sorry, exposure and variability. Variability is the level of the protection. If you know river embankment is enough high compared to the extreme level, then variability is very low. So even same level of the flooding, if variability low, has a uh, risk is very low. So variability is important. And additionally, exposure, society is important. This is can be exposure. Exposure can be a uh, number of the population, the uh, number of the aspect. If there's no people, no hazard occur, even 10 meter tsunami attack, right? So if there is a society, then hazard can be occur. So it is important to understand relation between hazard, vulnerability, and exposure or society relation for particular field. So this is a kind of standard uh, 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 view of the hazard. Then if you want to consider the climate change, this story become a more sort of different because hazard is going to be changed by the climate change, right? For example, if you are talking about the coastal area, sea level is going up, so hazard is not constant anymore. So today's hazard is different from the hazard in the middle of the century. So you have to consider the changing hazard in time. And the vulnerability is our you know, effort. So we can change vulnerability you know, from you know, dangerous to the safer by ourselves. So this is also changeable. And the last part is also curious because population can be changed in time. So in, the, in Indonesia, population is going to up, right, growth in the future. So even in the same hazard intensity, uh, total risk will be increased because your population is going to be up, growth. On the other hand, in Japan, our population is going to decrease now. So even same hazard in the society uh, is getting safer because <laughs> population is going down. So number of the people to be affected by the hazard is going down. So this kind of relation is important to understand in the context of the climate change. That's the uh, most important <laughs> message today. So please remember this. So rest of the part of my talk can be <laughs> forget. <laughs> then uh, regarding uh, focusing on the coastal situation, we have several natural phenomena to be considered for climate change. One is SLR, sea level rise. SLR, sea level rise is a one of promising change under the climate. So of course, uh, this is most important. On the other, additionally, uh, we need to consider two components. One is a wave, ocean wave climate, and second is a storm surge. Storm surge is not really severe in Indonesia, but in mid-latitude in the Pacific, fr from the Philippines to north, uh, storm surge has been uh, uh, occurred and uh, caused very severe uh, did that, uh, damage, uh, same to the tsunami, mega tsunami level. And the wave climate is not really severe in the sense of the number of the casualty, but for coastal protection, uh, wave is very important because it's daily phenomenon. So in, in the climate study, we want to know how much these three components, sea level rise, storm surge, and uh, ocean wave are going to change in different part of the world. That we, are, we have been discussed last 15 years. Then first, I just, this is only one uh, picture for sea level rise uh, from IPCC AR6. Do, have you ever heard IPCC <laughs> before? <laughs> if you heard IPCC, please raise your hand. <laughs> one, <laughs> two, three, four, okay. IPCC is an intergovernmental panel of the climate change under the uh, United Nations. So all the country related United Nations send up scientists to summarize latest uh, scientific knowledge of the climate change under the IPCC. So IPCC is a not a uh, research institution. It's kind of 
change of the market change. So in IPCC is also related to the uh, international foreign affairs. So at the end of the IPCC, uh, all the government agreed with uh, 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 report. So all the government checked the uh, sentence by sentence to make agreement what is the uh, cause of the climate change, how we can reduce greenhouse gas emission. It's a kind of uh, international uh, 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 law, part of the law. So IPCC is uh, very important for us. The last IPCC report was published last year. Then this is a picture from the last IPCC. Horizontal axis indicate uh, 1950 to the end of the century. Then different line indicate different level of the sea level depend on the greenhouse gas emission. The red color SSP 585 is a high emission scenario. If you we continue same you know emission uh, scenario. Uh, sea level will be changed up to uh, one meter at the end of the century. Uh, this is a mean expected uh, projection. And the uh, lower one, uh, blue line, is a SSP 129. It's a most, you know, ecological <laughs> uh, safer scenario. Even so, uh, we expect future uh, sea level will be increased around 40 centimeter to 50 centimeter. It sounds a little bit small, but uh, if you want to design the coastal dike, <laughs> 50 centimeter change is actually very big. Uh, additionally, SSP one, uh, sorry, SSP two, one to six is important. SSP one one to six is a two degree scenario at the end of the century. Two degree scenario at the century means we have to uh, establish zero emission at uh, 2050 or 2050. Zero emission means all the uh, carbon emissions should be zero <laughs> around the world. <laughs> it's a very realistic, and it doesn't realistic, so we, we have big doubt how we can uh, establish zero emission society entire Earth until the end 2040 or 2050. So uh, SSP 585 is a four degree scenario at the end of the century. So global average temperature reached at the four degree warmer than now. It's very high emission. So we expect real future should be in between two degree and four degree. It means we expect future uh, sea level at this end of century should be changed either to the one meter. And additionally, uh, this is the same story to the global mean temperature. Global mean temperature can be very similar curve like this with different units. However, sea level has a very specific uh, characteristic that is uh, irreversible. Temperature can be dropped down after the uh, reducing greenhouse gas emission, but the sea level cannot go down so quickly due to the long, long inertia motion of the uh, uh, ocean circulation. Then you may <laughs> find this strange bar at the end of the uh, uh, right hand panel. So at the uh, uh, 2300, <laughs> expected sea level should be ranged from 50 centimeter to nine meter. <laughs> at uh, 300 years later, <laughs> nobody seen in this projection, but important things is that even we stop greenhouse gas emission scenario, a greenhouse gas, sea level will be continuously increase for next few centuries. So this will be very severe situation for maybe five or 10 generations <laughs> after us. <laughs> so stopping a greenhouse gas is important for coastal protection. Then in IPCC, we have been discussed how sea level will be changed and how we can adapt changing climate last 10 years. But since last IPCC, uh, AR5, uh, fifth assessment report in uh, 2012, we started add more important value for coastal protection under the climate change. That is so-called total water level or total extreme sea level. That includes, uh, that uh, means a, a some 
of the uh, sorry, uh, change of the sea level, storm surge, and wave runoff. So including everything, sea level change, storm surge change, and the coastal wave height change, it is so-called total wa water level or total extreme defining coastal structures. That we discuss in IPCC R6, and we are on the way of the uh, agreement, so we want to discuss to the IPCC 7th report, AR7, which is expected to be published in 2029 or 2030. So then uh, this is the <laughs> most important part, so I'm going to briefly show you our recent results. In Japan, we have very strong national nationwide climate projection program supported by the Minister of uh, uh, Science and Education, MEX. So we have four groups for understanding and the project future climate. We, uh, one is the uh, Atmospheric Ocean Research Institute at the University of Tokyo, and JAMSTEC, uh, Japan Marine Science Technology, and uh, uh, MRI is the Japanese Meteorological Research Institute under the uh, Japan Meteorological Agency. It's same to the uh, BMKG in BM Tage in Indonesia. And the tema four is the impact assessment, which is uh, 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 managed by DPRI, and I'm PI of tema four. This is very unique uh, research program uh, last, actually, 16 years. We have this program last 16 years. Because uh, uh, first three group are climatologists, and the last group is the civil engineering. So we have been collaborating with climatologists, with civil engineers to understand future risk of the hydrology, river flooding, and the coastal flooding, and, and so on. So uh, now we are making integrated hazard model. That is, we try to uh, combine or, uh, yeah, combine uh, AGCM. AGCM means the atmospheric global circulation model. Uh, global circulation model project, predict future uh, climate, including everything. It's same to the weather forecast, daily weather forecast, but it's a range of the forecast is not week. It's decade to the 100 <laughs> years. So we try to integrate uh, MRI, uh, Japanese uh, BM Tage, global circulation model with uh, ocean wave, storm surge, uh, river line, inundation and uh, some uh, land surface model together. So it's a way, but we try to make a integrated hazard model with global circulation model together now. Then additionally, in this, our uh, new center on climate projection, we are very curious to get to the Asian countries uh, because uh, uh, Indonesia may okay, but some country is poor for uh, climate projection in their country. So we expand our projection to the entire globe, especially focusing on the Indonesia. So in, the, uh, in Japan, uh, sorry, Asia, Asia has a different climate characteristics. For example, green area is affected by the tropical cyclone. And then uh, 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 some area is affected by the water viscosities. And uh, uh, Pacific Island is important for the uh, climate uh, sea level rise. So we have different target in different Asian countries. So Indonesia, we are very curious in Indonesia and uh, Dr. Moto will briefly mention about change of the precipitation in Indonesia uh, after me. Then uh, regarding coastal area, wave is very important to from uh, present to the future change. Wave projection is uh, not so easy because uh, swell. Swell is a wave generated very far offshore, can propagate without any wind. So swell can propagate very long distance over the few thousand. For example, Hawaii, Hawaii around here is very famous for surfing, right? Uh, maybe it's 10 to the thousand Indonesian coast, including uh, Kuta Beach, <laughs> because swell propagates very far from the uh, uh, polar area. For example, in northern part of the Bali, Kuta Beach, uh, swell come from the Antarctic Ocean. Yeah, that is why you know, you know, southern Indonesia has a very 
long period and large way. So it's very suitable for surfing. Then to consider such long propagation swell for 2,000 uh, wave projection have to be include entire ocean. If you simulate near the on, uh, Indonesian sea only, you can calculate wind wave, but you cannot estimate uh, swell. That is important for the beach morphology. Then uh, we, so important thing is that it's time consuming and difficult. So we started a project under the WMO. Uh, WMO is a World Meteorological Organization. We had a project so-called CalCLIP, Coordinated Ocean Wave Projection uh, Project uh, with under the WMO. So main partner of CalCLIP project is uh, uh, USGS, CSIRO in Australia, and Environment uh, and Climate Change in Canada, Kyoto University, and uh, uh, UK Met Office, and so on. So we, you know, carefully coordinate projection future projection of wave for IPCC R6. Then this is our result. So top figure indicate wave height, average wave height, daily wave height. So in Indonesia is actually very calm because there's no <laughs> severe weather system through the year, right? So Indonesia is very <laughs> good for wave climate. It averages around one meter in the most of the places. But it goes up to the uh, either north or south because there are uh, polar winds blowing through the year. So in Alaska or Antarctic Ocean, average, daily average wave height is over four meters. <laughs> that is why uh, Antarctic Explorer is very difficult because <laughs> all the ships across this kind of uh, so-called death zone to the Antarctic <laughs> uh, continent. Then uh, bottom two panel indicate how much uh, in the future climate. So right-hand panel indicate four degree future scenario, and the blue color indicate uh, decreasing, and the uh, warmer color indicate increasing up to 10%. So you see most of the ocean wave height is going to be decreased because wind speed is going down in the future. Except some area like uh, uh, south, uh, west, west coast of the uh, uh, South America, or uh, southern uh, ocean, because this area, uh, uh, Antarctic low is going to be stronger, and uh, it can propagate the swell to this area. So we expect, you know, uh, either positive and negative change of the wave height can be occurred. Then right hand panel, uh, left hand panel is a lower emission scenario, two degree scenario. So it's almost same, but the intensity is uh, just uh, smaller than four degree scenario. So it's kind of promising result, which is uh, cited in IPCC L6 report. Then uh, uh, this we have a community paper uh, from Nature Climate Change two years ago. This is a summary of the future change of the mean wave height. So different color indicate a different characteristic of the change in wave. Some area wave height can be increased, and the other area wave period become longer. And, uh, Combination, <laughs> different combination can be occurred as well. If you are focusing on the Indonesian air area, most of the area can be brown. Brown indicate uh, wave period is getting longer, but no change of the wave height. That is an ensemble of our projection. So what means of the long getting longer wave period? That means uh, you will see the longer swell from Antarctic Ocean far more than now. So Antarctic, uh, actually, southern polar low is getting stronger, and the Antarctic Ocean is getting uh, you know, stormy, and then you will get more swell, longer swell from more you know, far field. It must be good for surfer, but I don't know how good it is <laughs> for Barai Technic Pantai. <laughs> then, you know, this is only one uh, ensemble, so we uh, discuss about uncertainty and reliability of the projection. So uh, I don't have a time to uh, talk enough today. So reliability is important. So we realize uh, is important, uh, same level to the climate change scenario. Climate change scenario is important 
but the you know uh, modeling ways also changes future projection. So both forcing and uh, a numerical model can change our future projection. So we have to carefully you know set up the numerical model understanding your future climate correctly. Then uh, uh, wave climate is also important in Indonesia. This is one example in Big Square. three or four years ago, I don't remember correctly. You may check this YouTube. So in uh, southern coast of the Java, there are a few casualties uh, by the wave overtopping and the wave uh, land up in, in very clear sky like this. Because a uh, few days before that accident in uh, uh, Java, a very severe storm was located in the southern uh, uh, ocean, Southern India Ocean around here, and this swell, actually this is swell, swell propagated day by day uh, to, this is the swell, part of the swell to Indonesia. And then a few days later, big swell attacked to the Southern uh, Java coast, and then under the clear this sky, big swell attacked to the coast. So you may, uh, <laughs> pretty easy to understand how, uh, you know, Antarctic swell is important for southern coast of the Indonesia. So, you know, Antarctic uh, uh, climate change can uh, uh, give more severe climate in Indonesia and the penguins in <laughs> Antarctic Ocean because <laughs> ice is going to melt and the wind is getting <laughs> So penguins will be <laughs> very hard to survive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so now we are now uh, making a projection of the future extreme wave in Indonesian coast. This is just tentative result in nowadays uh, wave climate. For example, this is a one by 50 years wave height in current Indonesian climate. So in southern coast, you know, uh, one by 50 years wave height is uh, above the four meter. And uh, this Indonesian strait is around 3.5. It's a little bit severe, but we are very curious how much this kind of severe condition is getting larger or safer in the future climate. Then this is our future projection of the extreme. So, uh, sorry, this is small, but the uh, left bottom panel indicates future one by 10 years is going to be changed. So obviously in Atat Antarctic Ocean, future one by 10 years extreme wave height increase 50 centimeter to one meter in the future which is almost equivalent to the sea level rise, as you remember, right? Sea level rise can be expected to increase half to one meter in the future. It's only part of the total sea level projection. If you consider the wave height, it becomes double because wave height can be increased same amount to the sea level rise in around here. Indonesia is tough because <laughs> in south is a swell, so swell will be increased, but uh, Indonesia strays uh, southern, uh, northern areas out of our projection now because there are so, so many small island channels uh, located in here. So at this wave climate half three, 50 kilometer resolution. So it's insufficient to understand the future of the Indonesian coast. So under the satellite, as Professor Farid mentioned, we curious and focusing on the more uh, detail of the Indonesian wave climate project in the next following years. We can give more detail of the you know, climate change depends on the either you know, northern uh, Bali beach like a Singaraja or, <laughs> and so on. Part is a storm surge. Uh, storm surge is not really important in Indonesia, so I'm not going to important in Japan. And then storm surge is very rare. Severe storm surge in the world can be occurred every once 10 years. Every, uh, once 10 every, uh, once every 10 years. So it's very rare event. But once severe storm surge is occurred, disaster is very, very severe. For example, Hurricane Katrina uh, uh, struck to Luigi in US. Uh, number of the casualty 2000 and uh, 
4,000 is a big number, but the number of the uh, uh, economic loss was over uh, 10 trillion <laughs> dollars. <laughs> 10 trillion <laughs> US dollars. <laughs> it's huge. So it's very difficult, but the event is too rare. So historical record cannot tell us accurate intensity of the storm surge because our modern record, uh, Japanese uh, loves <laughs> uh, observation and record <laughs> everything. <laughs> Even in Japan, we have only 60 to 70 years uh, uh, tidal record. But it cannot predict you know, one by 100 years or one by 500 years extreme storm surge within a 50 years record. Then climate projection is very useful for us. So we conducted under the climate program, we conducted huge ensemble climate projection, so-called default. So climate projection is usually 60 years. 60 years projection is almost same to the historical record. So it cannot tell us uh, longer, you know, uh, their event intensity. But we repeated climate, 60 years climate projection 100 times. So we have over 5,000, 6,000 years climate under the virtual hour, under the computer, you know, in the computer. Then if you have, if you have 6,000 years, you know, uh, virtual data, you can estimate one by 100 or one by 500 return period events easy, right, without any interpolation. So this is the reason why we conducted a uh, uh, large member ensemble uh, under the, this one. So it's virtual, but we got historical 6,000 and the future 5,000 years. It can be very useful for understanding heavy precipitation, heavy and This kind of uh, large ensemble prune is also easy to uh, uh, make assessment. So this is a Tokyo case. If you have 60 years, only big typhoon pass. Uh, uh, this is Tokyo Bay. Only big typhoon pass uh, Tokyo few times within a 60 years, right? Then few events cannot tell us, you know, hazard assessment, because hazard assessment, we need a frequency and intensity, right? But on the other hand, if you have 6,000 years, you know, typhoon pass like this way, <laughs> right? So we have enough virtual. Uh, one interesting is related to the tropical cyclone, typhoon is this. So horizontal axis indicate year, ty uh, typhoon per year. So generally speaking, uh, around 30 to 32 typhoon Pacific area. That is uh, blue climate projection in current climate and uh, uh, black is observation. But if climate uh, becomes four degree warmer than now, the number of the typhoon become half. So we will see few, fewer typhoon, half typhoon every year. So it's good. On the other hand, uh, right hand panel indicate intensity change. For vertical axis is intensity of the tropical cyclone in hexapascal form, uh, horizontal is uh, uh, 880 to you know, normal uh, 2014. So uh, blue is now and uh, red is four degree. And if you focus very intense typhoon around 920 hexapascal, now we will see very current climate. But if uh, a climate will be getting warmer to four degree, we will see ten times more. So typhoon will be decreased to half, but the intensity will be more severe. So that makes us more difficult to make a risk assessment. Under the, our uh, climate change projection, we try to integrate everything. So this is uh, one of example how we integrate storm surge and the river flooding simulation by RRI. RRI is a river, uh, river uh, flood simulation. 
will be explained by Dr. Nomura later. So now typhoon approached to Japan, and the uh, background color indicates the height of the sea level, storm surge, and the uh, color indicate on the ground indicate the uh, water flowing. And the uh, red cone on the ground is a potential <laughs> uh, flooding <laughs> river. So if very severe typhoon attacks in the future, you will see huge amount of the river is going to be <laughs> flood, as well as a uh, uh, storm surge and the cold. So this is a kind of worst case scenario in our country. So we try to estimate combining multi hazard risk uh, uh, between uh, river flooding and the coastal flooding together under the very severe uh, climate scenario now. So, so this, this is a global projection by ourselves. So uh, color in the coast indicate future change of the storm surge height in the percentage. Uh, cooler color indicate uh, storm surge height. So in mid uh, latitude, storm surge will be increased from uh, East Asia, China, Japan, US to some part of the uh, Europe. It's bad, but uh, in lower uh, latitude, including Indonesia, it, it will be decreased because uh, we will see less storm surge, uh, typhoon, then less uh, strong wind. I don't know much about the winter monsoon wind. That's under the <laughs> investigation now. We are now curious about the monsoon. But regarding tropical cyclone, you will see more safer future in Indonesia. But uh, wave height is going to increase, and sea level is going to increase. So combination is complicated. So this is a part of the uh, future projection, scientist part. Then now, I have 20 mi 10 minutes to go. Okay, yes. Then impact assessment is the second story. Because now we know, we, we have roughly know how our natural situation is changing, right? So next step is how this kind of change of the climate can be affected to the, our society. That is the impact assessment. So this is the uh, affected population in Tokyo metropolitan area by sea level rise. So dashed, dashed line indicates affected population uh, up to 2 million in Tokyo area, because Tokyo metropolitan area <laughs> is uh, totally 3,000 million, <laughs> 30,000 million living there. So maximum is uh, maybe uh, 20,000 around here. So if sea level is going to increase by, by any scenario, low emission to high emission, it monotonically increase to this way, right? If uh, let dash line indicate sea level uh, rise affected population by four degree scenario, more than half of the population will be affected in Tokyo metropolitan area. It's same to the Jakarta. Tokyo is very low lying area. Then uh, you s see the solid line. Solid line indicate same figure, but considering population. <laughs> Due to the changes in our decreasing population, affected, affected population will be stabilized around here. Because sea level will be increased, but the population will be decreased. So some, at some point, equilibrium, equilibrium situation can be occurred in some scenario. But other scenario, sea level effect is much stronger than decreasing population. So this kind of complicated situation can be uh, possible in depend on the country, on the high intensity change, uh, depend on the society change. So climate change has been science, but now it is changing from the science to engineering and the social science now. So civil engineer uh, uh, is very important for <laughs> this kind of research now. That is, this is why we are working together with climate change. Then uh, the last part is adaptation. Adapt adjust our society under the changing climate. We know the you know, coastal situation is getting severe in some place, especially in Japan or some part of Indonesia. But how we can adjust under the climate change? That is uh, adaptation. Sorry, this is some part is Japanese, but this is Osaka metropolitan area. Osaka is the second largest city in Japan. Population is uh, six million. It's very small compared <laughs> with Indonesia. 
maybe a little bit uh, double compared with Bandung. Uh, six thousand, six million people is living here, and uh, dark blue color indicates. Osaka was was similar to in Jakarta, because after the World War II, we pumped out underground water heavily, so uh, land subsidence was occurred very severely up to a few meters, same to <laughs> northern part of Jakarta. So uh, it was above the ground used to be, but due to the subsidence and the ground pumping, it, it decreased year by year. And we stopped pumping around uh, 1970 by law. So no, no more subduction, subsidence was occurred. But uh, you know, uh, you know uh, reduced ground level never returned. <laughs> then uh, these area are under the sea level even now. And the number of the population living under the uh, 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 high water level is uh, close to two million people <laughs> living in below the high water level even now. So back to the my <laughs> first talk, part of my talk, vulnerability <laughs> is exposure is very high. <laughs> then, oh, here is also important. This is a little bit higher ground because these areas are developed after the 1970s, so ground level is a little bit higher. So middle part is very bad because this area developed earlier, after before the subsidence. Then this area developed after the subsidence. So it is very interesting because ground level down and up <laughs> to the coast. And uh, this area is important for uh, some of the students in here because uh, here is a location of Universal, Universal Studio of Japan. So Universal Studio is very safe, but between Osaka Station to USJ is very bad. <laughs> this is our situation. And the severe storm surge was occurred in Osaka in uh, 1968. Uh, then uh, local gov government made a storm surge, three storm surge barrier at the inlet here, 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 inlet of the city of Osaka because it was economically effective, because if there's no storm surge gate, all uh, river embankment in the city have to be raised up, right? There's so many rivers and uh, uh, channel in, inside the city, and this is uh, Osaka Castle, because uh, canal and the river were big transportation before 18th century. So it's not economically effective good to raise all the <laughs> river embankment inside of the city. So they put three big gates and here, and uh, they didn't change height of the uh, river dike in here. Professor Farid, you may curious this kind of situation, so I can you know, guide to here in November, <laughs> if you're curious. It's 30 minutes from Kyoto. Then one big storm attacked to Osaka after 60 years. <laughs> Typhoon JB attacked to Osaka in 2018, five years ago. So this is a, a storm surge, surge barrier gate that I mentioned, and coastal area and the inside area. So you know, s maximum storm surge height was exactly <laughs> equivalent to that design level <laughs> of the this dike. So everybody happy to see this one because you know this you know storm surge barrier worked very well only one time in this lifetime after <laughs> installation. So it worked well. And uh, uh, yeah, cost protected this barrier was uh, 1.3 billion US dollar based on uh, official governmental <laughs> announcement. <laughs> if you believe this number, it was very, very nice. You know. The problem is it was constructed early 70s. Then after <laughs> 55 or 60 years, lifetime of this barrier was almost end after one big storm. Then it need to replace within a 10 years. So uh, we started to discuss renewal of this barrier for using to the end of the century, 2100. Then climate projection became important because we want to know 
how much uh, uh, protection level should be rise considering climate change, including sea level rise, storm surge, and the wave together. We discussed uh, four years ago <laughs> with government, and I was a member of the committee. So we tried to put all the, our projection to government to make it better. Then this is a schematic view how we can adjust natural disasters under the changing climate. The horizontal axis is here from now to the 100. The vertical axis can be water level. It can be water level in the river or coastal water. So, you know, under the changing climate, it can be, you know, rise up to this way. And the green is a protection level. So, update of the protection system take a long time. It cannot be established a day, right? You need you know, planning, budget, <laughs> construction. Usually, big construction business take uh, 10 to 20 years in, this, in Japan. So this dashed line indicate lead time to upgrade the protection system under the changing climate. So this is a schematic view that I draw before the Typhoon JB in 2018. So it looks ideal, right? We have to upgrade all the system before, uh, you know, climate is getting severe. This is a kind of wise <laughs> adaptation plan. But that uh, in this case, we have to update now. <laughs> and uh, this structure barrier will be used and at the end of this century. So actually, we have only one choice, one time choice to upgrade and uh, a decision should be made now. <laughs> it was very severe, you know. Ideally, it should be updated you know, every 20 years, changing climate, that should be ideal. On the other hand, for civil engineering uh, big structure, we may have uh, only one or two times to update at, at the end of the century. So we have to realize how we are going to uh, see the changing climate and uh, what kind of option we have under the changing climate. and. Uh, how many times we have a chance to upgrade. So this is a current uh, storm surge barrier, uh, like this. Then after the discussion, we design new one like this. It becomes more bigger <laughs> and uh, yeah, thicker. And yeah, but uh, this, we decided to make this. So construction ha has already started last year. So we update, upgrade all the three barriers uh, uh, adjusting changing climate uh, next uh, five years in Osaka. So in the beginning of my talk was just scientific part, but now this kind of situation is coming soon, especially we have many big uh, coastal, uh, not civil infrastructure developed in uh, 1970s to the 80s. So many inf infrastructure need to upgrade now and uh, most of the you know, infrastructure we use to the end of this century. And most of the then, like a, a drain, dredge, <laughs> sewage, everything need to update under the uh, climate change. So this also interesting for civil engineer because nowadays designing protocol is how we can estimate extreme barrier by the extreme barrier analysis. You know, we, we need to estimate one by 100 years uh, rainfall amount or uh, river uh, flowing, right? Then we can make a structure. That is a conventional way how we are going to make a, going to design civil engine structure now. But everything will be changed in time, you know. Sea level is going to be changed. Population is going to be changed. So we have to think about how we are going to adjust this kind of situation. So uncertainty, there are so many uncertainties. Greenhouse gas emission scenario is unknown. You know, It can be zero emission or very high emission, depending on our decision in the future, right? Then projection has uncertainty. Even for same greenhouse gas emission, projection has a wide range of the uncertainty. Then wave or other projection has also uncertainty. So we have to think about all uncertainty with changing our nature and society. So I believe uh, all the design protocol 
we need a civil engineering infrastructure, except seismology, earthquake, <laughs> and the tsunami will be changed. Maybe tsunami will be slightly affected by the sea level rise. You know. But uh, yeah, but I, I believe you know we are going to change all the design protocol if at least in Japan soon. Then last five minutes of my talk, I'm going to <laughs> touch more realistic <laughs> coastal things. So we are curious nature-based solutions, especially mangrove for coastal uh, disaster protection under the Satellite JICA project with Professor Farido and Dr. Ari Prasateo now. So uh, since uh, 2004 Indonesian uh, tsunami, uh, we realize you know, uh, uh, coastal vegetation is useful for reduce water uh, uh, variation like a tsunami or storm surge. So uh, many people have discussed about uh, how mangrove can be effective to reducing tsunami or uh, coastal hazard. It was uh, okay. Uh, it's, it's pretty good. And now, last five years, nature-based solution, including mangrove, is getting popular. Then we realized using of this kind of nature-based solution is uh, need to improve dramatically because there are two important components. One is we don't know much about engineering function of the mangrove tree itself. Mangrove was, has been you know, uh, 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 surveyed in detail of the plant or biology, ecosystem people. But for us, it's not insufficient. We need a more knowledge of the mangrove for coastal protection. That is not insufficient to make a design protocol now. And the second is this kind of mangrove like uh, nature-based solution can be changed in time. Gray infrastructure, concrete wall is rigid. It never changed, right? Ne at least 30 to 50 years. So it's easy to design. If you make a maintenance correctly, it's OK. But the nature-based solution, you know, uh, salt marsh, Dune uh, mangrove can be changed in time. So you have to carefully design uh, nature-based solution considering time changing and the maintenance is also important. You know, uh, tree can be you know, die in, in anyhow and uh, some local residents can cut <laughs> mangrove tree for easily for their you know, uh, daily life. So you know, uh, designing to installation is only one part of the nature-based solution for engineering function. We have to consider the growth and uh, uh, monitoring, maintenance, and the life cycle cost is also important. So it is uh, complicated than you expected. So this is a one of example of what we are doing now. So we, we put you know, a plastic mangrove tree in tank, generally, but actually we cut the mangrove tree put into the big wave tank in Japan. It was tough because we cut a mangrove tree from uh, national forest. <laughs> it was very tough to get a permission, but uh, we we got this you know, mangrove from the uh, our uh, Okinawa tropical island. Bring back to you know. Uh, then we try to understand acting force to the mangrove <laughs> and uh, how much wave can dump by the mangrove. Then. After this kind of experiment, we started to make a numerical model, how much mangrove can be dumped in this kind of vegetation area. So wave is coming from left to the right. So wave height can be slightly decrease this kind of you know, mangrove zone if you uh, check the you know, figure carefully. So if we make it mangrove zone wider, wave, can be, uh, wave height can be reduced. But engineering sense, it's OK. You know, in engineering design, we can make a mangrove longer and longer to the few thousand kilometers, right? <laughs> but in reality, <laughs> there's a kind of clear limit of the mangrove can survive in environmental issues. So we have to collaborate with engineering and uh, ecological people together because mangrove or ecosystem has a limitation, both engineering and ecosystem together. So it's very curious uh, project work, working with you know, Professor Farid and uh, Adi Prasetoyo. Then what's the engineering function of the mangrove? Yeah, my colleague, uh, collaborator of the mangrove ecological researcher always complained to me because we are only curious about the physical quantity of the mangrove. We want to know diameter, height, number of the root system, volume, and the frontal area. So 
that we really need to, you know, a hydraulic equation, right? Then we always cut mangrove tree <laughs> to measure these things and throw it away. So <laughs> my collaborator of the ecology people complain, please, <laughs> please treat mangrove more carefully. <laughs> but anyway, you know, this uh, very important understanding uh, drug force, inertia force, <laughs> and everything. If you know the hydraulic of the <laughs> uh, hydraulic or hydraulic engineering, then in Satrep's JICA project uh, with Professor Farido and uh, Dr. Adi Prasetoyo, we tried to, uh, uh, it's too small, but uh, make a monitoring, understanding uh, Indonesian coastal climate. And we try to make a numerical model to uh, estimate intensity and the frequency of the hazard. As I uh, said before, you know, these are very important for hazard assessment. And we try to understand how much, uh, how we can utilize uh, mangrove or coastal uh, beach dune for coastal protection as a part of the uh, nature-based solution. Then this is uh, uh, our team, uh, uh, Professor Farido, uh, Abdul Muhari from BNPB, and uh, Professor uh, uh, Maduriato from uh, Gajamara, and uh, Professor Diki from UI. So we are working uh, together since last year. Then, uh, then I re reach the uh, summary. So today, I just briefly <laughs> explain my part of the research related to climate change. So, uh, climate change projection and impact assessment to the coast is indicate tell us uh, two things. One is climate is getting severe to 2014, 2014 by any greenhouse gas emission scenario. Even, you know, zero emission, it will be getting severe to, 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 to 40, to 50. After that is beyond of our knowledge. It can be either stabilized or increased depend, depend on the uh, greenhouse gas emission scenario. So we can decide our future ourselves. You know? If you reduce greenhouse gas emission, our uh, severe weather will be stopped around 2000. 50, then uh, adaptation cost is less. But if we stop, uh, we are not uh, motivated for the uh, reducing greenhouse gas emission scenario, reduce uh, mitigation, then we have to pay the cost for the adaptation. So mitigation cost and the adaptation cost is totally off. That is we are very curious about now. And as I explained Osaka storm surge barrier case, it's not too early to consider the uh, impact of the climate change on the coastal zone or river area because, you know, we need a, a decade or a few decades to upgrade entire our infrastructure. And the adaptation part is a cost benefit is very important. So we need to, you know, motivate to upgrade our projection, including uh, society change, you know, everything, you know, population change and the industrial change actually. Because I didn't mention today, but uh, direct cost and indirect cost is also important. So supply chain is also important to consider. Then in mangrove, at least in Southeast Asia, mangrove is a very good option for the uh, adaptation to changing climate because it's everywhere and the cost is very small compared with concrete. So we are very curious how we can combine green and gray infrastructure together depend on the location and expected cost and expected benefit. So it's a part of the climate uh, a problem, but part of the society and economic <laughs> issue. So this issue is very curious for a civil engineer for next <laughs> 10 to maybe 30 years. Because scholarship to obtain PhD in Japan or Kyoto, <laughs> if you're curious, Please let me know behind of the Professor Farido. <laughs> and uh, uh, Calvin Sandy sitting here, he's going to join next week as a PhD student to us. So if you're curious, please ask to Calvin in detail. <laughs> and Terimakashi, this is the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you so much, uh, Maurice Sensei. So to save time, I think I only have several things to, 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 what is it, to have a note. The first one is for the students. The red um, sentence there, we invite highly motivated students to our laboratory. So please, please uh, use this opportunity to get uh, advanced in your education. Student here, hi, okay. And the second time is um, to assess the impact of the climate change on the hazard on the coastal. There are three things that we need, I mean three aspects. The first one is the sea level rise, uh, ocean wave climate, and then the storm surge. And we are lucky in Indonesia, we don't really have storm surge, and we still do have the sea level rise though, it's everywhere. And the third one for the wave climate, uh, we are also kind of lucky, but we need to really, really pay attention of the swell, just like uh, Professor Mori explained. So the swell will be greater, greater, because bigger from the south, from the Antarctic uh, part of the, the world, of the earth. So also the penguin, you mentioned the penguin will be have a will be having a hard time living <laughs> in the Antarctica. So probably that's pretty much it. Uh, I invite questions. This is the opportunity again for us to ask as, much, as many questions as you have for Professor Mori here. Don't hesitate, especially for the students. Please ask questions. Uh, anything that you still have uh, not really understand or you still have curious thing to know. So please, we invite maybe two questions first. We have uh, probably 10 minutes for this question and answer. Okay, Calvin. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I have two quick, uh, two questions actually, if you allow. Uh, so for the first question, uh, regarding the storm surge barrier, uh, I noticed that in Japan, you applied a, a great infrastructure to uh, to countermeasure the storm surge problem. Uh, have you ever considered about a green infrastructure uh, to be applied for to countermeasure the storm surge problem? Uh, maybe not fully green, but maybe a combination between green and green infrastructure. And then uh, for the second question, uh, I also noticed about SPCC 8.5 scenario. Uh, it is said in the graphic that uh, it is an exceptional scenario, but uh, is, this, is, is there any possibility that it might, uh, it might happen? And what, uh, what would cause the, those scenarios? Yeah, uh, Calvin, thank you very much. You can ask me uh, next week directly, but uh, <laughs> uh, it's a good question. Uh, so yeah, different scenario can be different projection, and the red color is a uh, SSP 585. It's a kind of unrealistic high emission scenario at this moment. So now, uh, scenario maker, we have scenario maker, is changing uh, this high emission scenario because it's too high. So we may have a maybe a little bit lower, lower high emission scenario next few years. That may be equivalent to the SSP 370. It can be uh, increased global average around 3 to 3.5 degrees. It's slightly uh, cooler than 4 degrees, but uh, maximum should be around 3 to 3.5 by coming new scenario. That is what uh, we expect now. And uh, regarding uh, installation or and the cons uh, considering green gray infrastructure in Japan, it just started. It's under the discussion. And then uh, it can be okay for local area because it's hard to clearly mention. But uh, you know, uh, cost benefit is important. You know. In Tokyo, Osaka area, population is over six million. And then government doesn't want to put any green infrastructure for coastal protection because there's so many uncertainties. Because government, we cannot wait 
growth of the tree was 30 years, right? <laughs> we want to upgrade the system immediately, so government prefer concrete structure for highly populated area because of the benefit. <laughs> hazard uh, exposure, uh, population too high, and economic loss is too high. On the other hand, if you go to focus on the local area in Japan, uh, population is decreasing and the uh, number of population is uh, fewer and now, then basically uh, it government never say like this, but uh, un my interpretation <laughs> based on the governmental you know bureau sentences, <laughs> they don't want to put you know hardware structure in local area, so they prefer putting coastal pine trees. Coastal pine trees are very common in Japan, same to the mangrove <laughs> in Indonesia. That can be one of option of the green infrastructure in Japan. So they want to uh, reduce spending money for hardware, but increasing green infrastructure for local area because total cost is very cheap compared with full hardware. But it's hard to communicate with local people because government cannot say, we don't want to spend so much money for your <laughs> area, right? So ecological value is also important. Because if you are talking about green infrastructure itself, you know it's a kind of lower uh, protection level. But if you include value of the nature-based solution, like uh, uh, ecological benefit, ecological tour, you know fishery, <laughs> and so on, you have more benefit, additional benefit. Then total benefit can be different from you know uh, you know only gray infrastructure. So that part is under the discussion in Japan. And I'm also happy to discuss this kind of things in Indonesia. <laughs> Thank you. Probably for this session. Question part? Okay. Any question? Nadif? Okay, Nadif, please. State your name. Uh, good afternoon, Konnichiwa. Uh, my name is Ahmad Fozan Nadif from Ocean Engineering. Uh, I want to ask about the mangrove ecosystem, especially uh, as we know that mangrove needs times to grow especially and we know if we want to use the mangrove in uh, as a structure to defend the coastal we need to use the mangrove that already grows but if we use the mangrove that still in the growth phase maybe the impact for defending the coastal is minimum so i think uh, how can we how can we combine the how can we solve the problem that if we want to grow the mangrove locally in the coastal that we want to defend, but uh, we also need to defend the coastal from this time? I think uh, that is the question. So, uh, if we if we if we want to use the mangrove that still in the growth phase, yeah, but but the impact is minimum. So I think how how can we overcome this situation? Asking uh, cost or <laughs> time, <laughs> which feature is the main question? Yeah. Is a cost or time? <laughs> uh, the, the mangrove growth needs time, right? So. Yeah, as uh, as as yeah, because uh, mangrove for the for defending the structure for defending the coastal area, we need mangrove as oh, we need a lot of mangrove, but. We know that mangrove uh, grow like some years need, need some years. So I think uh, how can we com how can we solve this problem? Like a growing mangrove is not problem. It's a nature <laughs> of the mangrove. So you just need to wait. Basically, you just need to wait. But uh, it's part of the designing process of the mangrove, right? For the planning and design, you have to include the growth of the mangrove in time. That is a kind of uh, communication between engineering, <laughs> maybe stakeholders, and the local people. You know, such, such kind of mangrove uh, protection cannot be established 
immediately. You, 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 from the planning to the installation maintenance, you have to communicate heavily, you know, how protection can be changed in time and, uh, and uh, how much you need to <laughs> install. Such, it, it's kind of, yeah, co communication, science communication. That, that's important. It's very different from the hardware structure. And uh, regarding cost, cost has um, so many options. So uh, horizontal axis indicate uh, width of the forest, and the vertical axis indicate height of the mangrove. So there are infinity option how to you know set up the relation between length of the mangrove forest and the height of the dike. For example, if you want to use gray only mangrove. Uh, forest should be zero, right? <laughs> but you have to make coastal dike higher. But if you have uh, enough length of the mangrove forest, you can reduce height of the dike. Uh, Constraction, uh, solving this equation is a cost. <laughs> How much you want to spend a cost? Then you have a solution in some way. So time, cost are key. 